Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, like the chairman, I, I, I appreciate bringing up Ice Kelton. Uh, there are a lot of people at this uh, table up here who never had the opportunity to know him. Uh, during the years I served in the House, we sat next to each other every Thursday morning at the um, House prayer breakfast. And I got to know him quite well, and he's sorely missed. Uh, yeah, I'd ask to have this chart placed up here so you can see it. I think those of the four of you can see this. This chart was put together by both the minority and the majority on the Senate Armed Services staff to kind of try to, to put into perspective uh, where we are and, and where we're going uh, with this thing. Uh, I know that a lot of improvements have to be made. We had a discussion yesterday on the Republican side about some of the things that will have to be done with uh, personnel, with uh, TRICARE and some of that, and, uh, those things. I would remind you that all of that you would find in the in the blue section down below. So it's not going to really address the uh, the problem that we have, even though it is important. Force structure, you can see how important that is. Now, what we've done for those, I think we individually have that same chart up here. You're talking about fiscal years 14, 15, on through fiscal year uh, 23. So the force structure is is a you know a very serious problem. Modernization program, the modernization we all know when things get tight, modernization and uh, are, is one of the things that goes. But by far the, of greatest concern is the the orange area. It shows clearly that that is where readiness is. That's where training uh, uh, takes place there. And I would like to have each one of you respond to your concern about that particular part of this chart, the orange part. Uh, how uh, I've always said that readiness equals risk. Risk uh, affects lives, lives lost. I'd like to have each one of you uh, kind of tell what you think in terms of the people being at risk and lives lost might be affected by what you're going to have to do uh, in this next fiscal year, according to this chart. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, th this chart describes exactly the problem that the Army has. You know, we have three levers, end strength, modernization, readiness, and we are taking down our end strength. And uh, we are looking at speeding up taking down our end strength, but you only speed it up so fast when you start to lose the money that you gain by taking end strength out. So we have a huge readiness issue between 14 to 17 uh, that we frankly will significantly impact our ability to respond in the way we expect to respond. The other piece is we'll have to stop some of our modernization programs, which means we'll delay getting new equipment five to ten years because we're going to have to stop programs and we'll have to restart them later on when we get back into balance. So for us, it, it is significant readiness issues. We will not be able to train them for the mission they're going to have to do. We will have to send them uh, without the proper training and, and, and actually maybe proper equipment that they need in order to do this. So that always uh, relates to potentially higher casualties if, if we have to respond. Yeah, Admiral Greener. Uh, for us, uh, it is force structure. We, we man equipment, Senator. And so what that means is to, to reduce, uh, to, to deal with uh, a reduction like this, we have to reduce force structure. So this chart would underestimate in the Navy how much force structure we would have to give up in the nearer term in order to garner savings. And that, that means, well, what do you do now? Well, for me, it's forward presence. So I make sure the, press, the forces forward uh, are ready, but those that are there for crisis response, right now I'm sitting at two-thirds reduction in that alone. So you have to be there with confident and proficient people and if they're not confident and proficient, then you're talking more casualties, and you have to keep a pace with the capabilities of the future, or you're unable to deal with a potential adversary, and that's increased casualties. So we, are, we will be slipping behind in capability, reduce force structure, and reduce contingency response. If we're not there, then who, somebody is out there, and they're going to have increased casualties. Yeah, uh, General Amos, you covered this in a lot of detail. Anything you want to add from your opening statement uh, in terms of this uh, readiness sacrifices, how it relates to risk and lives? Senator, the, uh, as you know, as I said in my opening statement, we, we move monies to maintain risk. Each service has a different orange uh, wedge. Mine is smaller than that, but that's for the near term right now because I'm paying that price to maintain that readiness to be your crisis response force. Uh, but that will only last 
probably not later than 2017. I'll start seeing erosion in about a year and a half. So, so we are paying that with other monies, infrastructure uh, training. And that's what you referred to when you said in your opening statement, you used the phrase, a formula for more American casualties. Absolutely. Yes, sir, Senator. This, th we are headed towards a force in not too many years that will be hollow back home and not ready to deploy. And if they do deploy, they will, in harm's way, uh, we'll end up with more casualties. Okay. In responding uh, to the question, uh, General Welsh, uh, I heard yesterday as, uh, someone talking to you about an experience that you had up in, in Alaska. Could you share that with me in terms of some of our, uh, our flyers? I'd remind people as they hear this that the cost, not necessarily for an F-22, but to get someone to a, a level of proficiency in uh, F-15, F-16, is about $7 million. So we're talking about huge investments in personnel. Would you like to repeat the, uh, the uh, statement you had made? Um, Senator, uh, I've actually had this conversation multiple places in the Air Force. Um, at one of our bases recently, I was talking to a, a group of young pilots who are eligible for our aviation career incentive bonus. Um, of that group, there were six to eight in the group. None of them had accepted the bonus to that point. In time. Not one. Not one. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean they're planning to leave the Air Force, but it certainly means they're keeping their options open as a minimum. Hmm. By the way, that, it's not just pilots. Uh, I was at another base where a couple of very young airmen told me that they love the Air Force, but they were bored. Uh, their, their particular squadrons were not flying. They were sitting on the ramp uh, because of the, the reductions last year, and they said at the end of their, in, the end of their enlistment they planned to find work that they'd be, they thought was a little more exciting. I haven't heard anybody in our military say they were bored in quite some time, yeah. so that got my attention. Well, I appreciate that. My time's expired, but I just want to read one thing out of the one of the most alarming concerns that we had uh, have raised uh, was the belief that your service may not be able to support even one major contingency. I'd like for the record, uh, when you stop and think about the collective service of the four of you is 156 years. So we're talking about a lot of experience, a lot of history, and I'd like to have you, uh, for the record, respond to that in terms of not being able to meet even one major contingency operation, if you do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Inhofe. Senator Reed. 